Good afternoon. I'm sure that all of you have at one time or another developed a pet peeve, like being made to wait in the rain trying to get on a crowded bus while someone in front is fumbling for their coins, or having someone whisper constantly at a concert. Well, I must confess that I too have a pet grievance. Only this one has to do with a phrase that is used by intelligent and well-educated persons. Very often you will hear them say with a kind of scorn in their voices, that's just hack music written by a hack composer. They are of course referring to the background of so-called mood music for radio and television shows and for the films from cartoons to short subjects to spectaculars. And what gets me so very furious is the fact that these people who are so glib about the whole thing having the foggiest notion of the amount of time, skill, and effort it takes to produce this hack music. Many of our finest musicians find an outlet for their works, which they might not otherwise get because of commercial needs. And chances are that the names and creative ability of composers such as George Kleinsinger, Alec North, Elmer Bernstein, Larry Rosenthal, Alex Semler, and so on infinitum might never have otherwise become known to you. These men and their compatriots are no fly-by-night musical adventurers. They have studied long and hard on their individual instruments and in the fields of theory, harmony, counterpoint, composition, and orchestration. And everything they write stems from this kind of solid musical foundation. That's why so much of it can stand on its own merit. On today's program, I'm happy to welcome and to have as my guest a colleague and close friend of many, many years, Charles Lichter. An exceptional violinist, he is also extremely gifted as a conductor and composer. And it's in this last category that he appears today. Charles, one of your compositions that I'm very fond of is the one you call Blue Valentine. I know it was used as background music for a five-minute film, but I wish you would tell a story of how you settled on the particular kind of orchestration you use. Uh, here, Yasha, the uh, problem was simple. Uh, merely to write a four or five minute piece, quiet, uh, sad, introspective, and in some particular way, uh, strictly American. The the business of the instrument wasn't too complicated. We know in our field that a low f flute or a flute in a low register or an alto flute always will create a soft, velvety, and rather sad atmosphere. The other half of the project was then to write a tune which was uh, within the harmonic structure, within the mood of the American blues. That's all there was to it, except to write it, which I did. What do you mean by the American blues? Well... Certainly it's not the color you're talking about. No, it's the flavor. It's a, a flavor in the major keys. Uh, naturally, it has overtones of Gershwin, Handy, all the, the traditional feel, which uh, we, we don't even talk about, uh, taken for granted, as it were. That's all I can really say about it. It's hard to analyze these things. They break down into very simple uh, chordal structures, really. Very simple for the trained musician. That's true. Uh, of course, we have many uh, composers and arrangers who use uh, very beautifully altered chords. Uh, they have their place. In this piece, I don't think there are more than three or four harmonies that change during the whole number. Okay, and now let's listen to The Blue Valentine by Charles Lichter. <laughs>
Charles, that was just as lovely and haunting a melody as any I've ever heard. Really a beautiful piece of writing. And now, something more gay. The one you call On the Hilltop. Will you give us a little history on that one? Uh, here I was asked to write music for a radio serial, a soap opera. Uh, not sponsored by soap commercials. Not sponsored. <laughs> uh, which ran two years on one of the major networks. The trick here was to not waste time, set the scene immediately with a spacious and uh, supposedly interesting theme, and then write music derived from that, which would run a few minutes, four or five minutes in length. Uh, that's what I did. That's all there is to it. All right, and right now, I'm going to sit back and listen and enjoy your On the Hilltop. <laughs>
That was On the Hilltop by Charles Lichter, my guest on today's show. I'll be back with some of his humorous music, written especially for cartoons and commercials, after this announcement. I honestly believe that some of the cleverest music and most original in concept are the ones that we sort of hear in the background accompanying cartoons and commercials and those showing animal scenes. Can any of us who have seen the Walt Disney nature films forget the ingenious way the music was used and how it helped enhance the entire production? Well, my guest for today also has written works that do exactly that. He has one that he calls Treble Talk. What about that one, Charles? Treble Talk is a setting of an old fiddle piece that we as students struggled through anywhere between the ages of 8, 10, 11. Uh, it was famous all through the world. It was used as an encore number by great violin virtuosi. And uh, my thought was that perhaps I could do something with it to take the curse of hard practice off it. The answer was to write a little jazz piano counter melody, which would be complete in itself. Uh, the piece is the Ries Moda Perpetuo. The piano part, with a little assist from bass and drums, stands on its own as a fairly cute piano piece. Together, it makes an interesting study. Here we go with treble talk. The background music for a cartoon showing a youngster actually enjoying the practicing of exercises. <laughs> Perhaps some of the up-and-coming violinists will also find it a little more palatable to practice the Ries perpetual motion if they had that kind of an accompaniment to work with. I know that many of you who do a good deal of commercial writing stay up nights trying to think up either new sound effects or odd kinds of orchestration, often because the budget allowed for music doesn't permit the use of large orchestras. Isn't that the story, more or less, of your uh, next piece we're going to hear, Hurry, Hurry, Little Bells? True, Yasha. Uh, here I was asked to write something that would uh, really jingle, jangle, tinkle, make all sorts of bell sounds, but uh, please not to use more than 
a small handful of men. Uh, the answer to this was the use of an instrument that isn't too prevalent. As a matter of fact, it's practically unknown, called the keyed glockenspiel. Orchestral bells, of course, are played with hammers or mallets, and there is a limit to the speed with which even the finest percussion player can manipulate. Uh, the trick here was to have something as fast as the fastest piano fingers could get around a keyboard. Now, the keyed glockenspiel is in size, something like a miniature piano has a keyboard. It is not a celeste. It doesn't have the sweetness of a celeste. It actually does have a bell sound. Against this, or with it, I wrote a piece for fast fiddles, as fast as possible, and in order to repay my poor struggling violin section for its efforts, uh, I incorporated a melody from another famous violin piece, especially of days gone by. It's uh, the third theme from the Scherzo Tarantello Vinyavsky. Uh, at the recording session, uh, the boys really, as they say, broke up when they came to it. We had to start all over and suppress our giggles uh, in order to get the piece done in the allotted time. And here now is Hurry Hurry Little Bells. That was Hurry, Hurry, Little Bells, written by my guest, Charles Lichter. I wish we had more time to hear some other works, but the clock says no. And so, Charles, thank you very much for coming down today and giving us a clearer picture of the vast amount of knowledge needed to write background music. Perhaps now some of our listeners will better understand the reason I get so angry when someone says, oh, that's only hack music written by a hack composer. Next week, we will take a trip to the Near East. This is Yasha Zaidi saying good afternoon.